Okay, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce the second speaker, Marina Vyazowska from Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne, who will speak on sphere packings, universal optimality, and, and Fourier interpolation. Marina, you have the microphone. Oh, thank you. So it's my pleasure to give the first scientific talk of today. <laughs> So I hope you can see yes, my first, first slide. Yes, very good. Yes, so today I will speak about uh, sphere packing, uh, universal optimality, and Fourier interpolation. And so the picture you can see here on my first slide, this is a lake filled with shadow balls, so-called shadow balls. And what we can see, even though the balls are just uh, put arbitrary on the surface of, of the lake. Uh, however, uh, on this picture, we can see the crystallization phenomena. The, the balls, they arrange themselves in a pattern. And so this is what I'm going to speak about today, the origin of uh, somehow maybe mathematical origins of crystallizations in nature. And so, even though this is a very difficult uh, topic with many different uh, directions to go, so I will start with this rather basic setup. So suppose that we have a, a set of points in Euclidean space, and uh, we fix some potential function p, and then the problem we would like to uh, what we can do, we can uh, compute the p-energy of uh, this point configuration. Uh, so um, it's defined as a sum of all pairwise energies, uh, energies of pairwise correlations between any two points. And for simplicity, uh, we assume that this energy it will depend only on the distance between two points. For example, on my picture here, we can imagine that these two points they have there is, there is there is small between distance small distance between them and so they interact strongly with each other and for example these two points they are farther away and so interaction between them is fading. However, our potential function does not a priori does not have to be monotonic. It can give preference to certain distances and so now we are looking at this problem very generally. And so also what we would like to do we would like to for the normalization reasons. Uh, so let's uh, uh, divide by the number of uh, total number of points in our configuration so that this would be an average uh, interaction energy per one point. And so in Euclidean space, of course, considering only finite configurations is not very interesting. So what we would like to do, we would like to consider infinite uh, configurations or what comes from practical equations, usually that we consider finite, but very, very big configurations. And so when I've, if our uh, configuration in Euclidean space is infinite, uh, then uh, we, we want to, what we want to do, we want also to uh, compute this uh, average interaction energy per point. Uh, but here we run in all kinds of analytical difficulties, so we have to be a bit careful with our definitions. And so what we do, well, we take our infinite configuration, we intersect it with a big ball around uh, origin, then we compute the uh, this average uh, energy of this uh, small part of our configuration, and then we let the radius of the ball go to infinity. And so this limit, it might not exist for certain irregular configurations or for strange shapes of our energy profile P. Uh, so what we can always guarantee is this limit infimum. And so if, uh, this, if we have not just only a limit infimum, but if the honest limit exists, then we would say that our configuration C it has p, uh, p energy equal to this number. And so here, one thing I should say that from in many interesting, uh, important uh, energies and many important configurations, uh, even this limit would not exist. 
For example, if we consider Coulomb energy for periodic configurations, here more, di more difficult normalization procedure is needed. But for our purposes today, we will think of our energy profile P as the fast decaying energy profile and we would like to ignore all these con convergence issues. Uh, also, it's probably it's, uh, ambition is too big to consider all uh, possible kinds of configurations. So we would like to, for them also to be regular and nice. And one uh, requirement we have for our configuration is to have a density. And so we, if we, we want this limit to exist. So if we take an, our configuration and compute its number of points in a big ball around zero, uh, then the number of points per uh, uh, volume should converge to some number rho, which we call the density of our configuration. And so here are a few uh, examples. The so first nice uh, family of configurations are the lattices. So lattices, as we have seen them already on our very first slide, they are very regular configurations. Uh, and for for a lattice in Euclidean space, it's difficult. It's easy to compute its uh, density, and also it's uh, easy easier to compute the p energy because uh, all points they are equivalent to each other, and so the average energy it will be just the energy of one point in our configuration. And so there is a slightly more general uh, family of uh, configurations, uh, per periodic ones. So here we fix some lattice, and then we say that configuration is lambda periodic if it's uh, invariant under all translations with respect to this lattice. And for a periodic configuration, we can we also can compute its density. It will be just the number of uh, uh, points of our configuration in any fundamental domain of the lattice decided by volume of this fundamental domain. And also the uh, P energy can be computed in the following way. So in periodic configuration, it's not true anymore that all points are equivalent to each other. However, there are, there are only finitely many non-equivalent uh, classes. And so we have to take only average over all uh, over our configuration module or the lattice lambda. And so this is this what happens if we simply apply our definition of the energy. And so in this second formula, it's a slightly nicer way to write uh, the energy, slightly simpler formula. But here I am cheating a little bit because here, I, as you remember, our energy, it was not defined if distance between two points is zero. So, but what I've done here, I've just defined my function is zero. It might be somehow not, the function doesn't have to be continuous. So I can just somehow insert this definition of the, what's the energy of uh, uh, interaction between two points that coincide. And then this would be a slightly easier formula. And so now, this is now the game we want to play is the potential energy minimization. And so it means that we are fixing a certain density because it would be unfair to, uh, to compare two configurations of different density and we fix a certain energy profile. And then among uh, all configurations of fixed density, we are searching for those with minimal P, P energy. And so if, uh, so if such a configuration C exists, which satisfies uh, this condition so that uh, any other configuration, so that C has well-defined P energy and any other configuration, uh, the dimensional Euclidean space of the of same density, it will have a lower P energy at, at least equal to the P energy of C. Then we also borrow this terminology from physics, we say that C is the ground state for P. And so now uh, the question we would like to ask, so suppose that we have our Euclidean space, we consider configurations of certain densities, but now we are changing our energy profile. 
And the question is, how would uh, uh, ground states depend on the energy profile? And of, of course, if you write, uh, if you ask this question in a full generality, it's clear that uh, the dependence would be huge because if our uh, energy profile has some uh, exotic form, exotic shape, and for example, favors cert certain distances over others, then of course the its ground states would have to would need to have also this exotic behavior. Uh, however, uh, even if we, we can restrict ourselves to some nice family of uh, potentials, for example, we can consider Gaussian potentials. Okay. So Gaussian potentials, they are nice functions. They, they are decaying, they, they are uh, first, second, and all their derivatives also behave in a regular way. So they are uh, re repelling uh, potentials. And so in this case, we might hope that uh, we, we could understand what's the dependence of uh, ground states on, uh, on this parameter alpha in the uh, Gaussian. And so let, here, let's consider one example. One example is the Gaussian core model in dimension three. And in dimension three, it turns out that the, if, if, even for this family of potentials, the dependence can be rather complicated. So let, let's consider um, configurations for, of uh, density one. And we are changing the parameter uh, alpha here. And so if uh, when alpha is uh, small, and so our, uh, so it means that energy almost does not change when we change the distance or changes very slowly, then we know that body central cubic lattice uh, is a good candidate. And uh, numerically, it seems that it is indeed uh, the, best solution, even though it's not, uh, there is no proof, mathematical proof of this fact. On the other hand, if this parameter alpha is uh, big, it means that the energy depends strongly on the distance. And then our problem becomes similar to the sphere packing problem. And in this case, we have another uh, a good uh, candidate, which is the phase central cubic lattice. It is the sol solution of the sphere packing, one of the solutions of the sphere packing problem. And here, at least numerically, it seems that it is uh, the best solution for big values of alpha. And then when alpha is exactly equal to one, then we know that these two lattices, they will give exactly the same energy. And this happens because these two lattices, uh, after they are normalized correctly, they are du dual to each other, like in a Poisson summation formula. So from the Poisson summation formula, we know that we know that E P one of B C C it will be the same as E P one of S C. And so if alpha is close to one here, we can actually uh, slightly get a slight improvement and uh, construct a new configuration, which is better than both BCC and FCC lattice. And uh, so the, I think this idea of this construction goes back to Maxwell and it works in the following way. So we are dividing our Euclidean space into uh, two parts, for example, two half spaces. And in one space, we are making uh, the density of our lattices slightly bigger. And in another half space, we make the density of our points slightly smaller. And so that the total density in the whole space would still be one. So total density is still one. 
And then in one of these uh, half spaces, we, are, uh, we fill our uh, points so that they form a DCC lattice. And another half we form so that it uh, creates an FCC lattice. And so here it's a rather nice convexity argument, which tells us that if we choose uh, this uh, row one and row two in the right way, then we cre can create a new configuration, which is better than BCC and better than FCC. And so it, it seems that uh, in this, when alpha is close to one, we don't have a, a clear uh, candidate for, for the best configuration and the dependence of uh, this best configuration on uh, alpha can be very complicated. And of course, we are very far away from proving anything rigorously mathematically in this uh, case. Uh, so uh, so I, what I've told you in the previous slide that uh, the shape of um, ground state it depends a lot on the energy profile. Uh, however, despite the example which I showed you, so Henry Kohn and Abhinav Kumar, they've made the following uh, definition. So they uh, say that a, a uh, configuration of points in Euclidean space with certain fixed density rho, it is universally optimal if it minimizes P energy for all completely monotonic functions of square distance. And here, so uh, completely monotonic so means that it means that it is a decaying function uh, so, so its first derivative is negative, its second derivative is positive, and so on. This holds for all derivatives of f. So it's, if f has to be infinitely differentiable. And so it's somehow, it means that f is a nice and regular uh, repelling potential. something like this. So for example, uh, every Gaussian is a completely monotonic function. So so the uh, if alpha is a positive number, and actually, the positive, uh, this, uh, the exponential uh, functions, they span a whole space of completely monotonic functions. So it means that uh, 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 configuration C, it is universally optimal if and only if it is a ground state for all uh, Gaussian potentials. And so in the same uh, paper where uh, Kohn and Kumar made this definition, they also uh, conjectured that the following four lattices are universally optimal. So first, the lattice of integers is universally optimal than the uh, hexagonal lattice A2 in dimension two is believed to be universally optimal. And same, uh, they conjectured that the E8 lattice in dimension eight and the Leach lattice in dimension 24 also satisfy same uh, condition. And so uh, uh, Kohn and Kumar, they've proven the universal optimality of the lattice of integers, which is on one hand, it's not surprising uh, because what can be better than the lattice of integers? And on the other hand, what, what probably was surprising that it was well, first, it was not a uh, obvious uh, result, not an easy result. And also that it was still uh, like when Kohn and Kumar got interested in these properties was still an open uh, question. And so the result I would like to speak about today 
It's that the, the result we have proven together with Henry Cohn, Abinav Kumar, Stephen Miller, and Danilo Radchenko is that the E8 lattice and the Leach lattice, they are universally optimal. And so maybe one thing I would like to say that uh, the universal optimality of lattices, it also uh, implies that uh, they are uh, solutions to the sphere packing problem, because this sphere packing problem, it is somehow a, a degenerate case of a uh, minimization for the Gaussian potential when the potential becomes extremely steep. And so our strategy for the proof, it consists of uh, three components. Uh, so first, what we are using, we are using the uh, linear programming bounds uh, to, um, for the energy of the uh, configuration. And then our linear programming bounds have to be sharp. And to achieve those, we have to uh, use a certain type of Fourier interpolation. And finally, after the first two steps, we can reduce the uh, optimality of E8 and Leach lattice to a verification of a positivity of certain explicit function on a unit square. And so let me start with the linear programming. So the idea of linear programming is to uh, re reduce uh, uh, geometric optimization question to a uh, optimization question in uh, uh, co conic optimization. So we want to linearize our problem. And so uh, this method has already been used uh, a lot for, for other geometric problems, for the kissing problem, for finding optimal spherical codes, for uh, proving optimality or for proving uh, bounds on the error correcting codes. And Kohn and Kumar, they have adapted this method to the energy minimization in Euclidean space. And so for the difficulty to of working with Euclidean space is that it has infinite volume. And so uh, therefore it's a bit different from, uh, from working with compact spaces. And so this is the uh, theorem which Kohn uh, and Comer have proven. So suppose that we have an energy profile P and we want to estimate the minimal uh, P energy of a configuration with given density. And so we assume for, for, to do this, we need to construct an auxiliary function. So this Schwartz function F. And the Schwartz function has to satisfy several inequalities. Uh, so first, this function should not exceed our uh, function P. Uh, then the Fourier transform of F has to be non-negative. And then if we are able to uh, construct such a function, then we know that uh, the lower P energy of, uh, of, of a subset in Euclidean space is bounded by this number, which uh, linearly depends on our function F. So we would like to maximize this uh, linear functional of F uh, subject to these two Uh, inequalities it has to satisfy. And so here's an idea of the proof of the uh, uh, theorem of Kohn and Kummer. Uh, so, so, so here let's, let's do this proof for periodic configurations. So let uh, C be a periodic configuration of given density rho then we can compute the energy of uh, C in this way. 
uh, such a sum. So at this step, we are using the fact that uh, uh, P is uh, bounded by F from below. So here we F. And so in the next step, we are just re slightly rewriting our sum. And then in the next step, we are using the Poisson summation. And so in uh, in the next uh, step, what we do, we are uh, rewriting this double sum here as an absolute value squared of this uh, uh, simple sum. And so this is, so to say, the main, the main trick of our proof. And so that the next step, we use the fact that F, the Fourier transform of F is non-negative. And so at the last step, we get the inequality we were looking for. So this finishes the proof of the uh, theorem of Kohn and Elkis. And so I should say that this proof we have done, it was rather wasteful proof. So we have uh, thrown away many terms, which could have been uh, positive. Uh, and so therefore, in general, we don't hope for a, a sharp bounds obtained by this method. So they, this method always gives us some estimate, but in general, this estimate should, there is no reason why this estimate should be sharp. Uh, however, uh, in the case of the E8 lattice and Leach lattice, and also we hope that in the case of uh, the hexagonal lattice, even though we cannot prove it, uh, we believe that the con so so for hexagonal lattice we believe and for the e8 lattice and leach lattice we know the the theorem of con uh, uh, and kumar does give a sharp linear programming bounds and so let's analyze in which cases that's possible so suppose that we have a lattice and that we know that this lattice minimizes P energy for some energy profile P. And also we suppose that the optimality can be proven by linear programming using a function F, a function F which satisfies all the requirements of the previous theorem. And then if in the proof of theorem, we did not have any losses in our inequalities, it would mean that all the terms which we have thrown away, they have to be, uh, zero. So in particular, it means that the value of function f has to be equal to the value of function p at all non-zero vectors of our lattice. And also the values of the Fourier transform of f, it has to be exactly zero and not just non-negative at the all non-zero vectors of the lattice dual to lambda. And also the inequalities, they have to hold to the second order. And so now it turns out that knowing this information about function f, it is already sufficient to reconstruct it. And so this is the theorem which we've proven uh, together with uh, Henry, Abinov, Steven, and Danilo. So here, let uh, we consider the dimensions to be either eight or twenty-four, and then this number n zero, which depends on the dimension, it would be either one or two, and this number, it's, so it corresponds to the shortest length of the shortest vector in the optimal lattice. And so we prove that we have a collection of uh, radial Schwartz functions, so the a n b n a n tilde b n tilde such that for every function f, which is a radial Schwartz function, the value of function at point x can be reconstructed from the values of this function at the uh, 
square roots of even integers, the values of its derivative, at the same points, the values of its Fourier transform at the square roots of even integers and the value and the derivative of its Fourier transform at the same points. And so what we know that this series, they uh, converge absolutely. So if we know all these values, then we would also know the function f. And so in the case of uh, the magic function, actually we do know all these values because we know that magic function f has to satisfy with the energy profile p at all these points. So maybe I would like to make a few words about uh, the Fourier interpolation. So it turns out that the Fourier interpolation formula from the uh, previous slide, it's not lonely. And actually there are, it prob probably it fits in a much, much bigger family of uh, uh, formulas of that kind, even though at the moment there are very few of them which we can obtain explicitly. And so together with uh, Danilo Ratchenko, we have computed an analog of this formula, only here instead of uh, having uh, interpolation of second order at po points uh, uh, at square roots of even integers. In this paper, we uh, have computed the interpolation of the first order. And from the points like this, so we take, we have to know the values of our function at all uh, square, simply square roots of integers, but we don't need to know the value of its derivative. So we have, so to say, uh, twice the, our set of points is twice bigger, but the amount of information we collect is twice smaller. Also, there is a very interesting uh, result by uh, Bandarian Karachenko and Saip, where they prove a certain version of uh, Fourier interpolation formula from the zeros of L functions. So there, this uh, formula is not for Schwartz functions, it's for different class of functions, but still somehow what is interesting about this formula, it's also an ex explicit formula. And then there are a few res results of other kind, which tells us that actually in the formula like this, we can, uh, we can perturb the nodes. So instead of considering these uh, nodes with uh, like algebraic structure, we can add certain disturbance to each of the node and then we will still, this uh, Schwartz functions, they would still exist, even though in this case, we will, will not have a nice, for example, integral representation for them. We will simply know their existence from a, a kind of perturbation methods. And then there is an interesting uh, result. I think the paper was not published yet, but there are a few, several talks on YouTube. Uh, about uh, which like, consider this problem of Fourier interpolation much more general and prove at least the existence of interpolation uh, for a very wide class of nodes. And here, no special algebraic structure is needed. The only thing which is needed is that the density of there is a correct density of nodes. Then we know that we would have the Fourier interpolation. So this maybe was a bit of. Uh, a detour from, from the main topic of, uh, uh, of, our, of what I wanted to talk about. So uh, let me now continue with the proof. So, so after we know that the interpolation formula exists, and uh, now what we can do, we can uh, reconstruct back our magic function f from from the potential function. So, and then it will look like this. So if we imagine that we have this interpolating basis A and B N in some explicit form, then we would also have the magic function F in, uh, in this rather explicit form. And so now if you want to prove that, for example, E8 lattice or Leach lattice minimizes P energy, it would be sufficient to check 
the two conditions which are posed on the magic fun function by the Kohn-Kummer theorem. So we would have to check that uh, f does not exceed p, and we would have to check that the Fourier transform of f is non-negative. Non uh, and so, as I already told you, that if uh, configuration is a ground state for every Gaussian, then it also will be a ground state for every completely monotonic function of squared distance. So it's, if you want to check that E8 lattice and Leach lattice are universally optimal, it's sufficient to check these two conditions for all Gaussians. And so now uh, what we would like to do, I would like to find an explicit formula for the magic function f. And in order to do so, uh, we would have to, uh, have to compute the ele elements of the interpolating basis. And so let's consider such a generating function, capital F. So this is a generating function of uh, our uh, elements in the basis, so one function for function for capital F for a n and b n and f tilde for a n tilde and b n tilde, and so this normalization is introduced for the convenience reasons, which will become obvious in a moment. So now this uh, the shape of this uh, interpolating function is tuned in such a way that the if we would like to write down the interpolation formula for a complex Gaussian, Gaussian with this complex parameter tau, where tau is a point at the upper half plane. Uh, then this interpolation formula will be equivalent to this functional equation satisfied by the gen generating functions f and f tilde. And so also this uh, generating function, we will see that it coincides with our uh, magic function uh, for, uh, for this real, for the, for the real Gaussian. So if we take, for example, for, uh, take a function f, and here instead of tau, we substitute uh, point on the imaginary axis, point it, then it will be the only possible candidate for a magic function for this uh, potential. And so now uh, for our functions f and f tilde, we have a system of uh, functional equations. So we, on the previous slide, we have already seen that uh, this function satisfy an equation like this. And also these two equations, they follow uh, from the shape of uh, our generating functions. So both functions, they are so say linearly periodic and also they satisfy this symmetry condition. And so now the, if we can prove that uh, this, if we were able to compute f explicitly and show that it has a moderate growth as a function of its first variable, then we would be able to we will be able to reconstruct all the analytic details of the interpolation formula. For example, we will be able to reconstruct the, to prove the convergence. And finally, there is one more simplification. So as we, you remember in the uh, Konkumar theorem, we had two conditions which have to be satisfied by the uh, magic function. But now if you look at all the uh, functions f for all possible values of tau and also use the Poisson summation formula in a uh, smart way, then we will see that uh, it's sufficient to prove only this one uh, inequality, not both of them, but only, only this one. And it will imply the a universal optimality of the E8 lattice and of Leach lattice. And so as I promised to you, so we will construct the function f explicitly. And so from the uh, theory of uh, automorphic forms, we know how to solve the uh, functional equations of this type. 
So we just need to somehow use this machine in the right way. And so we will search for uh, our uh, function capital F uh, in this form. So we, as, we, will, we assume that our function F will have this integral representation. And so here this kernel K, it will be a certain uh, a function of two variables, uh, which satisfies uh, certain, certain modularity properties. So, Okay, we will have kernels k and k hat, which will be defined on the h, it would be the upper half plane. So there are two meromorphic kernels. Modularity properties. And so, what I mean by modularity properties, I mean that they will have a nice uh, symmetries, nice transformation rules with respect to the modular group. So, this is the modular group SL2Z. It's a group of two by two at, uh, matrices with integer coefficients. So this group acts on the upper half plane by linear fractional transformations. And so for each uh, function on the upper half plane, we will introduce the so-called slash operator. So because if, if the group acts on the upper half plane, then of course it also acts on a uh, functions on the upper half plane and the only thing which is new here is this uh, weight so it will act on, on the function by pullback but it will also multiply by this automorphy factor and so we'll see that our kernels uh, k and k hat they will have nice behavior with respect to such uh, slash operators of uh, suitable weight and so for first thing which we can do, we can replace our write our functional equations for F and F tilde now using this new uh, notation. So for example, uh, this formula will express this almost periodicity or linear periodicity of function F and same will be true for function F tilde. And so the last equation can be expressed in this way. So. The first two equations are related to the action of this upper triangular matrix on the upper half plane. And the last equation is related to the action of this element, which is an well, involution in the, uh, at least pro pro projectively, it's an, it's, it's, uh, it acts by involution on the upper half plane. And so, and this is a slightly, uh, so here we had uh, these equations with two functions and here we can rewrite it only with one, with one function. And so in this proposition, we st state the properties of our meromorphic kernels. And so we say that there exists the unique meromorphic kernel K, uh, which would satisfy all these properties uh, so first, it is uh, it will have uh, poles only at the points where uh, tau and z are equivalent under the action of uh, SL to z, and it will have only simple poles. Uh, then our uh, kernel it will satisfy this functional equation, so the same equation as the equation satisfied by function f. Also, we require that. Uh, uh, the uh, residues of uh, function k at its simple poles uh, is of a certain particular shape and this particular shape is prescribed by our choice of integral representation for the function f so it's a certain explicit function which i don't include in this slide and finally we also have to put some uh, gross conditions uh, of k as uh, uh, 
one of its variables tau or z would approach the boundary of the upper half plane. So the boundary, it also has to be a meromorphic function with uh, certain uh, restrictions on the order of its poles. And so now what is important that after, after we list all these conditions, these both kernels, they can be uh, explicitly computed in terms of modular forms. And so here in this slide, I recall the uh, classical modular objects, which will be our building blocks for uh, finding explicit formula for the kernel K. And so here are the uh, Eisenstein series, the Ramanujan delta function, the J invariant. So all this fun uh, and the Eisenstein series of weight two, which is a so-called quasi-modular form. Also, we will need uh, what is called the modular forms of level two. So, so uh, Jacobi-Tita functions, so the classical objects, so given as a sums over lattice of uh, integers. And also another important function we would have, it would be a, a modular lambda function. And we will also use a logarithm of modular lambda function. So we'll choose one particular branch of this uh, logarithm. And so now our, uh, what we pr pr prove is that uh, our function uh, f tilde, it has such an integral representation. And this representation, it will uh, converge if tau is in certain domain, domain D, where D is a subset of the upper half plane. And what is important about D that it is a, that the, uh, uh, axis of, uh, imaginary axis is contained in D, so it's a domain like this. But exact shape is not so important for us, but it's important that the uh, imaginary axis is contained in D. And also this integral representation, it will converge uh, for uh, if R is uh, the length of a vector is big enough. So, and if uh, uh, we consider dimension eight, then this integral will converge for all positive values of R. And if, uh, uh, dimension is 24, then it will converge only for uh, r big or equal than square root of two. And so now, uh, as you remember, so to prove optimality, we, we, we would like to prove the, that this function is positive if tau is an imaginary axis. And so it turns out that we, uh, we can, mm, do this by showing that uh, the kernel k uh, hat is positive, which will immediately imply the positivity of f. And in dimension 24, there is a bit more work to be done. And so uh, now if you want to prove the positivity of uh, the kernel k, what we need to do, the last step we need to do, we need to find an explicit formula for this kernel K. And so our kernel K, it was, uh, we first we found its expression in terms of this uh, uh, function. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven different functions at the upper half plane. And then we restrict them to the, uh, imaginary axis. And so this is where we have to prove the uh, positivity of our kernel K. And, but now to make our computations feasible, what we will last step, what we will do, we will express all these functions in terms of the values of lambda function at the imaginary axis. And so this can be done with the help of classical functions, so-called elliptic integrals. And so each of the functions on our list, it is expressed 
the function of a value of lambda function with help of uh, logarithms and two elliptic integrals. And so for example, so in the case of dimension eight, so it's actually the same is true for dimension 24 is that we can compute this function uh, L8 and also we can compute the function L24, uh, which is a function defined on the unit square. And uh, so then the value of uh, uh, kernel K at the point tau and Z is equal to the value of function L evaluated at the uh, lambda of tau and lambda of Z if uh, tau and Z are both on the imaginary axis. And so we see that this function can be expressed in terms of uh, functions like this. And so this is how the function L8 looks like. And so the, uh, so we see that uh, of course it's not very difficult, but also not, not very simple. Uh, and the code for dimension 24 is even longer. And so as we, it seems that this function does not have any particular structure to make its uh, positivity obvious. And so here we have to go to the brutal force methods and uh, to estimate the values of this function numerically. And so at this slide, we can see the a plot of function L so it's at first time we have some good news. So we see that the function L, it is, look, looks like it is positive on the square where we need to prove positivity. At the same time, we also see that it's not an easy function. So here it's first it, because of uh, it's, it's, we have a pre presentation like this and this presentation contains uh, this factor. It means that uh, like our uh, function, so this, part of our function, it vanishes if x and y, if point x, y belongs to one of the diagonals of the square. And so this part also vanishes. So we have to divide zero by zero and we have this, so to say, virtual singularity along two diagonals. Also, we see that along one of the edges, our function goes to infinity and in other, on other edges of the uh, square, it seems that this vanishing. And so it's here at these corners, it has rather unpleasant singularities. And so in this picture, I just write how the function behaves as we approach edges of the, of the square. And so it means that if, when we check the positive positivity of the function, uh, it's, we, we don't have one uniform approach which will prove uh, positivity everywhere. So we have to use the interval arithmetic and we, this interval arithmetic, it works differently at different parts of our square. So we have the so strategy for, for a generic point in our square, we have a, a separate strategy for for diagonal for diagonals and also uh, intersection of two diagonals is extra work also if you, when we are at edges we need a special uh, we need a different algorithm to verify that everything is fine near the edges and finally most difficult parts are this uh, the small squares because it's where uh, in each of these squares so like three singularities intersect and so this is uh, this last part of the work it was done so computationally so now uh, Henry uh, Cohen and Abhinav Kumar they have developed a rather fast algorithm and it verifies the positivity uh, like an usual computer, like a laptop, laptop within an hour. So now the computational part works very fast. 
And so at the end of my talk, I would like maybe to address some open questions which still arise. So first is uh, for universal optimality, we know that uh, the Z lattice, the E8 lattice and the Leach lattice are universally optimal. And we are pretty sure that the hexagonal lattice is universally optimal as well. But then interesting question is, is there anything else? So for example, is it true that D4 is universally optimal? And also there is an interesting configuration in dimension nine, which also might be universally optimal. Another interesting question is more general. So for which uh, pro interesting problems can we hope for sharp linear programming bounds? And so where can we search for more examples? So we already know that some examples come in, as from geometric optimization. Recently, there have been example from conformal field theory, from uncertainty principles, but maybe we can add something more to this list. And the last also interesting open question is uh, how the free interpolation formulas uh, work. Because at the moment we have several examples. We have examples so to say, of algebraic nature with very rigid structure of nodes and uh, where we can compute uh, the uh, interpolating basis rather explicitly. And we, however, we know that this is only somehow isolated points in a sea of much bigger number of inter interpolation formulas, which exist for uh, random nodes with no structure. And here are the results. Yeah, so they are somehow proven by perturbative methods and much more flexible. But the question is how can we, uh, how can we use them? How can we construct them and prove interesting estimates with them? So this is, all I wanted to say for today. So thank you very much. Maybe you have some questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Marina, for this very interesting lecture.